All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we'll be doing today. Um, the name of this session is 10 Ways to Improve Employee Productivity Using Dynamics AX 2012 R3. What we really want to focus on on today's session is really uh, talk a little bit about the framework. And my, my guess is that I've got a, a pretty good mix of people in here who are evaluating Dynamics AX and then people who have actually got it implemented and are looking for ways to optimize the use inside of their company. Uh, what I really like to do uh, during the course of today's session is talk about 10 key areas that break down into different segments. Um, this is the last, and I promise you, this is the last. I could hardly believe this when I presented this to the speaker uh, uh, branding group. Uh, but this is the last PowerPoint slide you're going to see this morning. <laughs> All right. And then after this, we're just going to step right into Dynamics AX, and we're going to take a look at some basic features and functions that you may have seen during a pre-sales process. Maybe you're familiar with some of them. Uh, and we're going to talk about how we can really tailor Dynamics AX from an end user's perspective to just sort of speed up basic things like data entry, some tricks about uh, how we can go through and uh, um, I'm talking to my microphone down like this, but I do want to turn my phone off here. Just on the expectation that my daughter always has a uh, tendency to call me right in the most awkward time of day. So what we want to do when we're taking a look at Dynamics AX, we want to talk about a few key points here. We want to talk about optimizing the user interface. When we optimize the user interface, we want to talk about personalizing forms. And now we can do things like manipulate a form to be able to speed up data entry, data capture, and make things more efficient, and then actually share this experience across multiple users. And then there's another area that's of great interest. Um, there's some features inside of Dynamics AX that allow us to do things like manage documentation pretty efficiently. We have a couple of different ways of doing that. We can go through SharePoint sites. Uh, and this is where we talk about leveraging SharePoint Online and uh, an Office 365 type environment. And how we can actually use things like team collaboration sites to be able to manage documentation or use native document handling inside Dynamics AX. Uh, if this is a topic of interest and you have very robust document handling needs, uh, we have several vendors on the floor as well who offer very advanced capabilities around document automation. Um, for the purpose of this, this discussion, though, we'll be talking about how to leverage Office 365 in Dynamics AX. And then we talk about how we actually extract and find information inside of Dynamics AX by using some of the four basic search features that we have available to us just as end users. Well, so uh, being in the services industry, you know, I've got a great interest in things like the leveraging tool sets like Microsoft Projects and how we can import and speed up data transition, especially if we're in a new implementation. Uh, just out of general interest, do we have uh, a good representation here from services industries or groups who use Microsoft Project or similar tool sets? Just a show of hands. All right, so roughly a third of the group. Um, this is, might be of interest as well if you are uh, heavy uh, project users, um, you know, in other areas like engineer to order type processes or, or that sort of thing. But it's just, you know, these are some of the things it's good to know that they're in the product, right? And then we'll talk about workflow automation uh, policies and get into some basic intercompany functionalities. Um, when we start looking at these areas, we're going to be looking at a very high level. The, the idea of this presentation is really to give you an idea of some of the features that are inside of the product that you may not be aware of. And then if they're of interest, to be able to dig down into them in more detail, either by speaking uh, after a session with someone like myself or Sean Gallagher over here, uh, or hunting down uh, like an SSP or a TS or somebody inside your partner community, and then digging into the topics that you've seen presented here. All right? So let's go ahead and, and jump into Dynamics AX. And apologies here, but I'm going to be, uh, for a portion of this, because I'm working in an application, I'll be speaking the microphone. I may not be making a lot of eye contact because my presentation screen is up here, but I'll, I'll try and make sure I look up and, you know, so you guys just don't feel like a, you've got a robot up here speaking to you. Let's see. This one. Number eight. All right. The first thing I'm going to do is actually restart this instance on a, uh, on a larger screen here. So for the purposes of this uh, demonstration, I'm running off of a local Hyper-V image. Uh, I typically would do this off of Lifecycle Services. Um, however, I wasn't sure what my connectivity was going to be in the screen. 
And it, have you guys, have you, has anybody gone through this lifecycle services track yet? Have you, have you seen what we're doing? Yeah, it's a pretty amazing tool, isn't it? And you know, we've got this uh, um, approach now where uh, we're actually um, standing up uh, the ability to run instances of Dynamics AX in, uh, in Azure. And what we can do in there is we can actually uh, just spin up like a development or a test or a production instance literally by going in and picking the size of the server you want, the allocation, whether or not it's going to be production or development and test environment. Um, you click on deploy and four hours later you actually have a fully functioning instance with demo data of Dynamics AX, which is pretty amazing, guys. I mean, you know, if you, if you think about this and, and the effort that it has taken in the past to go through either your internal staff or to go through, um, you know, uh, maybe a consulting group and actually go through and spec out and stand up an instance that you might be tearing down in, you know, within a week uh, and, and just transitioning that into like a, a four-hour process. It's a, it's a pretty significant advancement. All right, so this incredibly tiny screen up here is uh, Dynamics AX Role Center. And um, there's a few things that, um, that we can see when we use a Role Center. Uh, everyone in here, we use a Role Center for the most part, if you've got a deployment of Dynamics AX. Um, are, do we have an end users in, in the audience today? Just basic show of hands? All right. Now that's good, that's more than 50% representation. And most, of the, most people in here are uh, 2012 deployments. So when you're, as an end user, just uh, anybody, feel free to speak up here. When you use the role center, do you actually tailor your role center to make it specific to your use of the system? Have you, have you gone through and, and played around with these features a bit? Did you, you just sort of accept what the IT group is, is put on you and, and that's it? Because this is really a powerful way. This is probably the most powerful way you have of interacting um, with your data set behind the scenes. So uh, the role center breaks down in, into a couple of different things. One of them is the business intelligence aspects that you see here displayed obviously through graphics, indicators, or drillable areas. And we're not going to go into how we tailor, um, you know, how we tailor the, these BI type tools. Uh, Sean has regular presentations on business intelligence. There's a lot of information that's readily available for download. We want to focus on how can I tailor this role center to be useful to me as an end user on a daily basis. Um, the way that I like working with uh, Dynamics AX also as, as an end user uh, for many years and then now uh, at Microsoft uh, for two years, uh, I, I interact with um, Dynamics AX on a regular basis. I actually do all my expenses through Dynamics AX now. Uh, and coming up on April 3rd, I'll be doing them all on my cell phone, which makes me really, really happy. So the basic idea behind the role center is I've got some features here uh, that, are, that are pretty handy. I've got this ability to establish a default queue and I can just click on a queue uh, and it'll take me into a specific list that's predefined. And this is a, a queue that I've added by um, just clicking on personalize this web part and adding a queue to the role center. Probably not of that much great interest because you know you just got to take a default setting. But if I go back now and let's take a look at uh, some of the other areas that I have inside of a role center, um, I can manage queues, I can add queues. The add queue are the default settings that I have. I've got a list of very many here uh, that'll just give me like an unfiltered data set. But I can also go into the system and I could go into an area, say like project management and accounting. Open up a list page. And then on the list page, I could define a filter by field. And what I've done is I've created a constrained data set now. So as a project manager or contract manager, I might want to actually just see my data without having to go and dig through everybody else's every day. Right? Pretty common scenario. We can think about the same thing on any page, by the way. Uh, you know, if you uh, work with journals on a regular basis and you only want to look at specific journal types, if you're looking for specific inventory groups or other types of information, go through, create a constrained list, look at the items that you want, right? And then I have the option under filters to go up and save as a queue. Uh, a lot of people don't know this exists, but it's, you know, pretty handy little tool, right? So if I go through and save this as a queue, I'll have the option to give my queue a name. We'll call this one, uh, we'll call this, uh, you know, 
uh, my contracts. All right. A few other options show some of fields. If I was looking at summary information, you know, I wanted counts or you know any sort of aggregation. Uh, and then I can run alerts that'll actually result in a pop-up to tell me when counts get above uh, a certain number of uh, you know um, transactions. For example, uh, purchase order gets above a certain number. You know, sales orders. You know, number of sales orders that are open gets above a certain number, etc. And then I can make this visible for everyone, myself, or uh, specific profiles. In this case, I'm personalizing my space, so I'm just going to make this available to myself. And if I come back onto my home page and run a refresh option, we'll see now that I've just created uh, the first step in being able to personalize my experience with AX. This is a small thing if we only do it once, but think about how you interact with the system on a daily basis, uh, and you typically would go into a form constrain your data set to the things that you're interested in looking at. Right? And then every day, you're doing the same thing. So if you begin to apply these concepts to your daily work effort, you could establish a string of cues across the top to give you a look at your data on a regular basis and then work off of the roll page in order to present the information you need in a meaningful way. All right, easy enough, right? So now let's go in and let's actually start getting into some of the other areas that, uh, are, that are of significant interest to us. And they, again, we're keeping this in mind <clears throat> that what we're doing is we're attempting to personalize our experience with Dynamics AX. Anybody familiar? Just you know, basic yeah, no, you know, coffee fueled with going through uh, this file option and digging through some of the areas like views and tools and options and the way that we can use these things to tailor our experience. Is that, we're all going to jump up in excitement here and say yes. All right. <laughs> well, the, the first thing that I like to do, uh, if you take a look at this on a regular basis, often when security is defined, security is defined to apply to a large group of people. But on a daily basis, you might only work in one or two modules, and you don't want to go through and pick through this list of modules every time to find the one you want. So generally, people find some good tricks. Do a drop down, hit the first letter, goes to the module they're looking for. Maybe they scroll up and down and look for the, you know, the module they want to activate. Uh, there's an easier way to do this, though. Like, like most things in AX, uh, once you know where it is, it's pretty easy to do. So we go into View, and we can hit our Navigation Pane Options. And you'll see here, I currently have every single module activated. Now, being in the services industry, there are really only a few things that, that I really care about. Uh, I've done a little bit here of pre-work, and I've actually moved the modules that I use on a regular basis up to the top by clicking on them and then moving them to the top. Um, this will speed up my selection criteria here. But in the services industry, there's only a few areas that I really look at on a regular basis, and I'm going to deselect everything else. And what this will do is simplify my experience when I go to look at my drop-downs on my modules. And now you can see I have a greatly simplified list of things that I have to do on a regular basis. Uh, generally, what I find when we're, when we're working with customers um, in the field, that they'll find people who are very specific, and, and they'll just tailor this list of the modules that they need down to one or two accounts receivable, accounts payable being the most commonly used. Uh, project managers would typically put this down to service management and project management. Just for the purposes here of what we're walking through, I've left a few other ones open because we'll be stepping into things like organization, administration, and that sort of thing to, to look at setting up document types. So you guys are starting to get a feel here for how I'm tailoring my experience. You know, uh, I've started off with basically a blank canvas. By the end of this presentation, we'll have uh, a, a form and a usage that's very specific to me as a project manager user. Um, there's another thing uh, that's pretty handy um, inside of the uh, view forms. Um, we have the ability, if we're looking on a particular list page, so let's go into project management accounting. You see how easy it was to get there and I wasn't scrolling around. Right? Isn't that great? Now, if I go in and I open up a list page, uh, we'll notice here on the right we've got these sort of fact boxes here. Right? Um, if you're looking, uh, you know, if, if these things are of interest to you, they're really handy. You can drill down. You can get a lot of good information about the particular record that you're looking at. But you can also tailor your experience with the fact box by going through the view process the same way that we did previously. So 
we can go down to View, and you'll notice here that some of these other selectable options have become available. So I got Preview Pane. That's the uh, Preview Pane is the uh, uh, quick view of a record down at the very bottom of the screen. There you see the long white bar that goes across, and then Fact Box is in the upper right hand corner. And by going here, I can actually go through and I can turn the fact box pane on or off, which increases my screen real estate. In this case, I want to leave it on, though, uh, and I actually want to experience this slightly differently. Uh, when I look at the fact boxes, I can turn the individual ones on and off as well. In this case, I want to leave my actual cost up, but I don't want to see my project forecasts. Again, just a really quick and easy way for me to tailor my experience and present information that's useful to me in a meaningful way. I think uh, favorites, we've all, uh, I, I don't think there's a single person in this room who hasn't been using or leveraging favorites through a, <laughs> a web browser or some other format in a while, so I'm not going to belabor any points on this. Um, but if you want to use favorites and organize them, this is also a great way to speed up your use of the system. Let's go into the areas, um, actually, that, that are really uh, significant interest to us here. And we're going to go through and actually start with the Customize um, button here, where I can have different toolbars that are available to me uh, running across the top. Or I can go into Options. And really begin to tailor my experience in another way. When I start looking at options, I have the ability to drive things like uh, the language that's available to me. So we have customers who operate in multi-language environments or people who are more familiar, like Spanish first, you know, this sort of language uh, option. Where I'm from in, in South Texas, uh, Spanish first is a big deal. You know, everybody speaks English, um, but probably 50% or more of the population actually grew up and were educated in Spanish and are more comfortable speaking Spanish. So they use English in a business environment. Uh, for conducting business, but when they see presentation on the screen, they actually prefer Spanish language. So here they could just go through. Um, I mean, we could make Yoichiro a native Spanish speaker or Japanese. I think Yoichiro is probably Japanese, but we'll you know, have alternative options. And by toggling the switch, then uh, shutting down my rich client and logging back in, I would see my presentation of everything would be Spanish language. We also have the ability to set up things like default email addresses for alerts and notifications, uh, drive some of the, the things that we see on a regular basis, like auto completion on forms, uh, and then we get into some miscellaneous things like you know time zones, etc. Right. Here's one um, that's of good interest. Um, if you find yourself having to edit records quite frequently, you know, and, and you know, this is like a three-step process typically. Right? I start off on the list page. I double click on the record I want. I click on edit. <laughs> right? So if, you, if this is something that you find on a regular basis, you find yourself doing, by coming into tools and options, you can actually flip on the form so that when you go in, you go automatically into edit mode as soon as you click on a record. This is applicable to most forms, not all. There are some that, that, that we like to enforce the three-step process on, like parameters, forms, and other things of that nature, where you don't really want somebody to just be able to make a change. Um, but this is very applicable for things like you know, making changes to, um, to projects and that sort of thing. All right, some of these areas are more system administration oriented, but let's get into the ones uh, that, that would be of interest for the end user. Uh, being able to handle delegation for workflow and routing when somebody shows up you know, on, uh, uh, on a regular basis. Um, and uh, let's say they want to go on vacation, right? Anybody go on vacation? I haven't been on vacation in years, but you know. <laughs> but if you were going to go on a vacation in a hypothetical situation, you could delegate all your workflows and routings so that people would be able to log in, uh, put in their information about who would be the next level of approval, right? and then workflow notifications would route to the appropriate person. Now, here's one that I think is of great interest uh, to most of the end users who, who don't typically know that it exists. Um, but if you look down here in, in this lower right-hand corner here, we see we've got a few indicators. Has anybody ever looked at these, know what they're for, right? Yeah. And then there's another one that's over here on the other side, kind of hidden away, dock handling. But 
these indicators actually, uh, they're, they're more than just a, a pretty little image down in the lower right hand corner. These actually drive functionality inside of the system. And I can turn them on or off by using the tick boxes here. So for instance, you know, if I turn off, say, uh, company accounts, uh, show currency, customizable help. Let's just go ahead and strip this down to nothing real quick. And I can apply. You'll notice everything's gone now, right? Uh, coming back in, I want to show things like my help text. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to leave the clock off since I've got you know at least four different ways to tell the time. Um, I'm going to do definitely show company accounts though, and this one is really uh, this is a nice feature for people who find themselves working in a lot of different companies, maybe flicking flipping back and forth as an account and having to do different journal entries. Project manager maybe has P&O responsibility across multiple companies, so they have to open up different instances, right? Uh, currency is another one for people who have to operate uh, a company in two different currencies. So let's say you've got a reporting currency, um, you know, euro, uh, US dollar is a pretty common one. Uh, but I also have a transacting currency where uh, my transaction currency might be US dollar. User ID is useful for testing. Uh, we'll turn on customable, customizable help. Uh, alert status I like quite a bit. Uh, view edit record buttons, record navigation, right? And then uh, show form details and document handling. If we go ahead and apply these, you'll notice everything starts popping up again. All right, it looks fairly familiar. So we close out of the form here, and let's just take a look at what we've done now. We've, we've tailored our user experience to be able to open up things like alert forms that would let us know just by clicking on the button if we had anything in the queue. Uh, these are the same alerts or workflow items that show up uh, off of the home screen in my role center. So uh, I'd also have a numeric indicator that told me if I had anything in the queue. Uh, and we saw previously that I could go through and set up a, um, um, a role center that had workflow and notifications on it or notify me via pop-up uh, if I had something coming through. So now, in this case, I'm in the, uh, a company that's not set up with multiple currencies. But if you do have multiple currencies set up, the ability to flip back and forth between these currencies would show up here. And I could specify the date of the rate and actually drive a display on the screen that showed me the current value of things like contracts uh, or financials in the reporting currency uh, and then toggle back into um, my transacting currency. Another one that's pretty handy here is the ability to click on the uh, company indicator in the lower right hand corner and it pops up the company accounts form which now allows me to switch back and forth between company accounts. So I'll do that by clicking on uh, USCMF and then hitting a new workspace, and now I have two workspaces open, um, plus an indicator that'll tell me that I'm switching back and forth between the two uh, via an uh, info log pop-up. Right, pretty handy little feature. So useful for people who have to switch company accounts. I'd like, like to know that I'm adding value to somebody out here today. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and just to simplify my interaction with the system here and avoid getting the pop-up each time, I'm going to close out this USMF company. And we'll just leave USSI open. And if we had any document handling uh, additions here, by clicking on the doc handling icon in the lower left, I'd be able to see what was associated with the record. Simplistic document handling, right? I don't know if you guys use this. Uh, there's probably some users, some not. Uh, we find if you, if you have very simple document handling needs, this is a great way to be able to associate contracts with the contract record, maybe uh, you know, a master services agreement with the project. Um, if you have very robust document handling needs, very common in architectural engineering space, um, typically, what we recommend is setting up a SharePoint team collaboration site, and we'll take a look at how we can do that um, both by creating a site uh, directly from the project, we'll, we'll take a look at that a bit later, uh, and then also how we could set up a team site using Office 365 and then link the two so that you can just browse out to it. We're going to check um, just one more thing here quickly. Uh, when we get into things like um, notifications, right, 
Uh, if we want to see pop-ups or control whether or not they come through, we do that off of notifications. Now here's a really good one for anybody who's ever been extremely annoyed by getting a pop-up notification every single time they switch company accounts. You can turn that off here, right? <laughs> if you see this, like a sort of a, it's, it's in its upper section uh, right here, right? Warn company accounts change. And when I was, uh, I spent 10 years in the field um, deploying Dynamics AX all the way from version 2.5 up to uh, 2012. And I would have to say the most common request that I got from an end user was, uh, one, how do I turn off the notification that I'm flipping back and forth between company accounts? It, it just seems to drive people crazy on a daily basis. Person, personally, I kind of like it because when you flip back and forth, you, it gives you an idea which one you're in. Uh, um, but there's another one uh, that, uh, um, that was, uh, again, far and away, probably, probably second only to company accounts, um, was this confirm deletion and confirm update tick box, which is right here. Uh, and this is where, you know, if you've ever gone through and you're about to uh, delete a record and you get the pop-up that says, are you sure you want to delete this record? And you're like, well, yeah, that's why I clicked on delete, you know. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can drive that here. Um, but if you want a confirmation as well on an update, uh, which is really common, uh, if, you, if you have to make a, like a, a very specific adjustment and you just want people to realize before they make a change uh, that they're about to impact something financially, um, then you can turn on uh, confirm update. And that will also uh, ensure that the user gets a pop-up that says they have to click on yes before they can commit the transaction. And I'm going to click on preload here. It's going to take just a second for this to load up. Um, this is a really good way if you've got, um, let's say you have a very specific uh, implementation of Dynamics AX. Um, and let's say theoretical situation, very common in our world a company that has a lot of manufacturing processes internally, and they also have project management processes internally. And the project managers really don't have much to do with manufacturing, right? But they have a lot to do with projects. And they go in in the morning, and they go to load a screen, and they notice like some system performance issues, things maybe a little bit slow, takes a while for a form to pull up. And this discussion here is much more for the technically oriented uh, people who might be in the room. The preload function is actually pulling data and pre-caching it into a number of tables. And if we scroll through the screen, there's, there's literally hundreds of tables in here. So if you went down to the level of actually analyzing the way that you're looking at data and transacting and loading forms, you could eliminate a preload function that, say, loaded manufacturing data for a project manager where it wasn't necessary. And you can actually speed the performance of the client up significantly by not loading data that the end user wouldn't be using on a regular basis. So, more, probably more technical than, than most people uh, need, but it, I think it's important to make um, people aware um, that, that there are, are some ways that the technical group can help optimize end users' experience with the solution. And another area that a lot of people might not be aware of, uh, we, ha we actually do have uh, Microsoft Outlook integration with the Microsoft Outlook client. Uh, this is not Exchange Server integration, this is integration with the client for the end user. And you can go through and configure the way that you'd like to transfer and share data between, say, like Outlook contact lists uh, and activities and tasks by setting this up and then choosing the type of data you push and pull. So really, really common request here. Um, we, you know, we have two products. Uh, we have Dynamics CRM, um, which is a, a great and very specific sales and marketing tool set, um, which is you know, used quite frequently in organizations. We also have a lot of organizations that leverage the CRM functionality that's native inside of Dynamics AX. Very common request that comes out of the field is, if I have field sellers and they're maintaining a list of contacts inside of their own Outlook instance, how can I reflect that information inside of sales or prospect pipeline or a contact registry inside of Dynamics AX? So there are a couple of ways that you can really be efficient about the way you push and accumulate data inside of the system. Um, one of them is by turning on the synchronization and actually pulling all of the information from a field seller's uh, contact list into Dynamics AX. They'll get a, you know, a contact record with them as being the primary person responsible. And then as an organization, you have the ability to understand the types of contacts that you have and associate them with particular records you know, that would be like a customer record. And then typically what we do is we see the salesperson be the salesperson responsible for the overall customer record as well as the person who's tagged to the contact. So they still have the assurance that they're being able to control their customer base and their contact base, um, but the business is able to get an overall look at, at 
what's going on from a sales pipeline standpoint. Um, another way that we leverage is sort of integration with other office toolkits is through MS project integration, and we'll actually be taking a large project and pulling that into the WBS. All right, so starting from the home screen here, uh, if I go in and let's just start playing with some of the setup we've done. If I go in and I take a look at my contracts, uh, and my contracts are all of the city manufacturing contracts here, then I can, from this point, I can go in and I can open up a form, let's say. If I go into a form, there's a few things on a form uh, that typically I, I want to see. Um, you know, I want to see uh, all the fast hubs that are available to me. Uh, I want to be able to see, you know, basic information on here. But there's also a lot of information that's just never quite applicable, that never gets removed through security. If we, if we think about this realistically, the, the task that we put in front of somebody who needs to go into find a role, we set them down and we say, here's this enormous database that's like 1,400 tables, tens of thousands of fields, all of these business processes, and we're going to take you, Mr. IT specialist, and we're going to have you be responsible for stripping out all of this stuff that an end user in finance or accounting or project management doesn't need. You know, and typically you look at this guy who's in IT and he's, he's just got this bewildered look on his face. He's like, how do I know what a project manager needs to look at on a daily basis? You know, or what's a production, you know, demand planner need to see? And, you know, and so what happens typically is we get this sort of like an overarching security that allows people to conduct business processes, but also leaves the sort of the end user interface a little bit messy. So we've got a lot of fields and things that display that don't make it intuitive for an end user to be able to go through and use the system. So we, we've had an approach for um, ever inside Dynamics AX that, that is a competitive advantage. You know, anybody who's come from an SAP or Oracle or other world realizes that it's not that easy, typically, to modify a form and make it specific to you. And we've, we, we addressed that uh, a long time ago in, inside Dynamics AX, from, from at least version 2.5 forward. Uh, and we've done, we do that through this option for being able to personalize forms. And then a little known thing here is actually being able to share that form personalization across people inside of a department. Right. So when I go in and I go to personalize a form, I'm, I'm going to spread the screen out so I can see it in uh, two different pieces here. Right. Um, I want to be able to see the form in the background. And I want to be able to see the way that I'm impacting the form uh, by making different choices on the right. So this form, I've already, uh, I, I'd actually already uh, added a field on the top here. So I'm just going to reset the form right now, right? And I'm going to close out. And you'll, you'll notice that this uh, scheduled fully staffed field is about to disappear. Right? And you see it, it's gone, right? And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go back and, and I'm going to add that back. So I do that, again, I open up the form, right click, choose personalize, and I get a pop-up that gives me sort of a tree view of all the different fields and different options that I have for personalization here. Now, keep it in mind, again, as the end user, it's easier, uh, especially when people are running split monitors now. It's much easier to do this by keeping the two elements side by side. And now, at this point, I can go in and I can really begin to, uh, to manipulate the way um, this form appears to me. So report sorting, I mean, what the heck is this field? Has, has anybody ever used this field? Any, anybody ever use this field group? You do? I, I see, <laughs> I've got some takers down here. It's always a dangerous statement. No, it's not. No, it's not at all. Um, what, what I find is that people use this for being able to extract information from the system, you know, you know and be able to, you know, to get some other features based off of a higher hierarchy. Uh, but I see a lot of people go through and, and you actually use search to create filtered lists as well. And, and then they always ask, what do I use this for? Uh, in our case, we're going to say, uh, unlike our, our, our special group down here, that the rest of us go, I really don't want this report sorting field to show up anymore. <laughs> we're going to hide your hack here. So uh, what I've done is I go through and, and uh, I, I've selected just at the highest level here. Uh, I've selected on report sorting. And you see in the upper right where I have these options. Like I know this stuff's really tiny, guys. Sorry. Uh, but it, in order, I've got name. Uh, visible, edit contents, skip, label, width, configuration key, etc. So there, there's a lot of really good information that, that's presented on the personalization form. I've just hidden report sorting though, and you'll notice over here on the left um, that it's disappeared, right? 
Um, I'm going to do the same thing on a couple of different elements is here. I'll turn off uh, payment retention. Uh, I'll turn off vendor agreements. And so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm just going through and I'm selecting the areas uh, that, that I don't want to see. Uh, financial dimensions uh, are important to me. Budget and forecast are important. Uh, setup, etc. So we'll leave these other elements here, right? And now I want to do one other thing. I actually want to add that uh, I want to add that um, uh, staffing option to see uh, in the header information um, whether or not my project has been fully staffed uh, resource-wise. So the way that I'm doing that is I go through and I click on Add Field here at the lower right, and I can go and I, I know in this case that that field is on the project's table. And I know that it's going to be called uh, scheduled. And I'm going to add that field up above. You see that it's just shown up here in the upper left-hand side. But it's not quite in the right space. So I can just drag it down here, right? And now I've got a form that's very specific to me as a user. And in, in this case, it might actually be useful for all of the other people inside of my project staffing, you know, my project management group or PMO to be able to leverage the same form. So I can just save this form out, and I'll call this one uh, my staffing view, all right? All right, so where did it go? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and how do I get to it? Is it anybody, anybody familiar with this feature? Again, and these guys out here? Anybody else? So I've got two people in the group, three, four, five, all right? So if I, if I were to go in and log back into Dynamics AX as a separate user, I'm, I'm logged in as uh, Yoichiro right now, but I'll, I'll go in uh, via remote desktop here. Uh, it's actually a new tool we have called uh, Rio Desktop, right? Remote. I'm going to log in here as uh, Sarah, as my user. And what Sarah does, as um, soon as this authenticates through, what Sarah does is she goes back out to the same form that I just personalized. And she goes, uh, and she, she chooses the form. And the typical situation is that Sarah and Yoichiro are sitting right next to each other. And uh, one person looks at the other person's screen and goes, man, I really like the way you're working with the system here. And Yoichiro says, oh, that's great. Let me save the form for you. And then Sarah goes out and pulls it up. Very, very common scenario. Very useful as well if you find yourself in a situation early in an implementation where you're doing a lot of data entry. You know, and, and this is very common, like uh, particularly during cutover. You, you pull up a journal and you need a certain sequence of fields in a journal in order to capture information. And you've got a crew of people that you bring in and they're all pounding away on the keyboards and you just want to avoid all the questions. Go in, personalize the form, set it up, distribute that form out to all the end users. You've just cut out probably about 30 or 40 minutes worth of question time and, you know, uh, and, and having to teach people how to go through and set the system up. All right, so Sarah, now she's going to go into project management and accounting. Uh, she'll go into all projects. She just opens one up. And we notice here uh, that we don't have project staff or we've got here, this is actually a different form. Um, this is the old one. So I'm going to go to personalize here and just reset this so we can see how this works. I go open this up. We'll see that project staffing doesn't show up anymore. All right. So now I'm playing the two roles. I'll, I'll play this one with Sean. I'll be, hey, Sean, that's a great form that you have up there. Uh, would you mind saving that out for me? <laughs> he says, sure. He says, sure. So now Sean says, sure, uh, I've just saved it out. Uh, and, and I said, great, thanks a lot. So I'm going to go into personalize now uh, after Sean's told me that he saved the form. I'll do a retrieve from user and, and just pull it up. All right. And this is the one that I just created a second ago called staffing view. Reopen. And here we go. Pretty, a pretty powerful little known feature here. Very, very useful set. All right, All right we're going to step back in uh, to Yorichiro now. And some of the other, uh, and just you know, not to belabor anything here, but you know, we can move fields around by uh, moving them up and down, left and right, etc. I think everybody gets the idea here. 
Um, there's another thing that's really important to know if you, uh, as an end user you find yourself interacting with your technical group on a regular basis. There's, there's some really useful information that's presented on this, uh, on this personalized thing. So if you look here in the lower right hand corner, uh, we have something called uh, system name. And the way you interpret this is pretty straightforward. Uh, and I apologize again, I know this is relatively small. But the system name uh, gives me an idea of the field that I'm looking at. So um, you'll notice up in, in the, upper, the upper section here it says proj ID. And then below that it says proj table dot proj ID. So if I find myself having to work with technical or report development staff, um, you know, the same scenario that we laid out earlier. These guys are really talented at what they do, but they don't necessarily know what we need to do as end users on a daily basis. So I find myself often when I'm designing reports is that, that often if a re somebody who's a report designer doesn't have very specific information, what happens is they design a report that they think should be the report the end user needs. And you find yourself in this sort of loop going back and forth going, it's not right, you're sourcing the information from the wrong place. And so they're in sort of like hunt and peck mode trying to figure out how the data needs to come out. What you can leverage as an end user, you can leverage this to help speed that process up by going in and giving them very specific, specific information. You pull up personalized, click on the field that you want to source information from, and then you tell that technical person, I need ID to show up here on a report. I need a sum of this field to show up in aggregation. And this gives them the tools that they need as a technical person to be able to source that information correctly the first time. That other information that's contained here that's useful uh, is particularly when we're talking about things like actually having a form modification that rolls across the entire group. By clicking on the information tab, we can see information in this, in this case, the upper field tells us the form that we would need to tell a developer to go out and modify. Combine that with the information that they have from the table and the field ID, and then all of a sudden you're talking about being able to move into a rapid deployment cycle for doing development. The rest of that stuff is going to be more interest to the technical staff rather than us. Right? Okay, so uh, just, a, just a quick cycle here. We've gone through taking a look at modifying a role center, being able to add queues, establishing filters. Uh, we've taken a look at being able to do things like turn on and off things down in the lower section of the form. We saw these things are interactive. Right? Being able to flip back and forth between currencies and company IDs. Uh, and how to use this uh, document handling icon to indicate whether or not something's out there. So now let's actually let's step in and just take a look at a couple of things um, that might be of uh, use to people on a daily basis here, um, just for being able to, to run some uh, basic entry processes. And let me actually, I think I'll, I'll think I'll do this through a journal. All right. Um, anybody in here an uh, active user of journals? Probably quite a few, I would guess. Counting staff over here, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Here's, here's a feature that a lot of people don't know about um, that actually, uh, when, I was, uh, <laughs> when I was also doing a lot of journal entries as an end user of AX uh, during implementations. The, um, the journal lines uh, actually follow the active view on the left, and, and this is really handy when, uh, you know, and this is true across a number of different forms inside of AX. It's a, it's a good little tip to know. So if you go through and you take a look at the journal and you look at the lines on the right, if you're working in a large screen environment, you can actually go through and indicate the journal that you're looking for here on the left, and you'll notice the data sets changing on the right. So um, what, what I've seen quite often in the end user community is people go to a journal Right, they open lines, they work on the lines, they close the lines, they go back to the journal form, they click on the next journal, they open lines. Um, so th this is a good way to be able to actually work through the system pretty quickly. Right? Now, there's another thing that's really interesting about this is, is you can go through and you can actually have multiple layers of these items uh, open. So let's say, you know, we, we'll put another um, layer of complexity in here. Um, but uh, when I click on, the, uh, I clicked on the wrong section here, but let's, um, let's go through and let's say that I had an active document on the line. I can open up a third form and all three of these actually cascade now. So every time I click on the journal, it reflects the lines and I'll see the documents associated with either the line or the header transaction. This is really useful if you find yourself in a position like accounting very common vendor invoices being attached to a vendor record via document handling so you can do a reconciliation process. 
So instead of having to go through a three-step process every time of clicking on, say, like an accounts payable journal, looking at a line, going to dock handling, opening it up, you keep all three of these forms open at the same time, click through each journal in sequence, you'll see a listing of the documents, you can then open them up. So you, you've gone from like a three-click operation to like a one-click operation just by rolling through everything. It doesn't eliminate the need for data entry, but <laughs> you know, it's still, uh, it's still a handy way of interacting. And another one that, that's really big for people who find themselves working in journals on a, on a regular basis here um, is actually being able to put in a date pretty quickly. So a you know, common scenario would be if I wanted to go in and put in a um, uh, quick, what, what is today, the 17th? So a common scenario is people go in and, you know, maybe efficient data entry, but they type in the whole string, right? Uh, there's a good way to accelerate this. You can actually use the T key, and it'll give you today's date, right? Handy little, handy little tip. It's not earth-shaking unless you have to do this a thousand times a day. Uh, but you can also put in, uh, say, like, uh, just a sequence like 3.12, and you'll pick up whatever the current year is. So I find whenever I'm having to go through and do a lot of data entry, uh, I actually find myself moving to the uh, touch, you know, 10, 10 key touch, and just using like three dot whatever date it is, and then tab, because then it keeps me from having to type in like the year every time. So uh, handy tool set. Um, there's some other things as well um, that you can do when you go for entry. Uh, and I don't remember if I got my journal text setups on this one, but you can go through and, and actually put in uh, journal text, uh, for instance, like car. And um, when you're doing this, um, let's see. Yeah, I've got my default text option here. But I can go through and I can set up default text so I can type in just a, a, like a, a sequence, like car, and what will happen is I'll get a pre-population of for consistent journal text entries, it'll say cart rental transaction. And that way I can push information through into my journal text very easily um, by putting in just a, a brief sequence of, uh, you know, codes perhaps or, you know, or, or a brief description of like air and then populating air travel. And here's a good example of this. In this case, um, if I typed in April, then I get, uh, I, I get the uh, term April hours to show up in my journal text. This is not specific just to projects. I'm, I'm just working the projects module. This is also true against other areas like general ledger. All right, so let's get into, uh, let's get into document management quickly. So um, document management is an area where um, we, we've got some good native capabilities inside of Dynamics AX. We can go into an area like document types and I can actually designate a type of document by giving it a name and then associating the document with a record. So I could go here, perhaps, and uh, create a new document type, and I'll call this Receipts. I'll just give it the same name here, Receipts. And then I've got the ability to drive things like attach a file, um, but I also have several other options here. Um, I can create an Excel workbook template that actually, if I create a document type of an Excel workbook template, uh, the system will make a call against Excel, pull up an Excel file, pre-populate information into Excel. I can do whatever I need to do to manipulate it, save it out, and it will actually upload directly back into Dynamics AX based off of the criteria that I put in here. Um, we, have, we have another area as well called Document Templates, which is very handy um, for things like master services agreements or contracts that are basically boilerplate text that you want to populate with prospect information, customer information, or other things that are sourcing from, say, like a project. Uh, you know, or a customer uh, record or, you know, any of a number of things, production orders. And you can go up and hit the template option and it'll pre-populate this Word document, Excel document, et cetera, uh, with all of this information, which then you could submit out via email using things like uh, Office Outlook integration. So these are some of the options. Uh, attach URLs, which would give us the ability to go through and uh, associate a SharePoint online site, uh, workbooks, create application documents, simple notes or source something from the template library. Uh, and then here I associate uh, archive directory, um, which gives me the ability to you know, provide a secure storage location for all these documents. Easy enough. So what exactly have I done here? 
Well, if I go back into, say, project management accounting, uh, and since this is a receipt type transaction, I'll move into the expense record. And then from here, let's say I want to associate a document uh, via document handling. And I go new. You'll notice here in the drop down, I'll just highlight it, and, uh, I'll highlight it here with the mouse. And what I've done is I've given myself a categorization capability for documents associated with records. This is very useful if I need to run queries against the database and get specific document counts or be able to source information through another reporting tool. Right, a lot of the vendors that you'll see down on the conference room floor uh, use similar functionality to be able to tag and push documentation into Dynamics AX. It's a good question to ask if you're looking for more robust functionality around document handling rather than what you see here. This is a good way to start a conversation with them to understand how they're actually tagging information and pushing it in and associating it with a record inside of the system. Yep. Can you, can you have that receipt document type then associate with different, in different windows and different transaction types? Oh, absolutely, yep. Yeah. So um, let's say, for example, I was inside of uh, an accounts payable transaction and I was going to create a payment journal. Um, and here I'll, I'll just uh, create a new one, all right? Typical vendor payment journal. And you'll see here um, that receipts is available to me off of this other journal as well. And it, so it's obvious because the primary key is related? Um, because the document type is just a general uh, classification type. So it's just a, it's a, uh, it's a document type I've created that's available for association with any record inside the system. I can, I can make it more specific as well so I don't wind up with a list of hundreds of different document types. So can, can you group it by, say, you know, receipts for AP related only and so forth? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Now let's um, let's just move back to our home page quickly, and I've uh, just for the uh, sake of time savings here, I've actually um, created a link to my team site. Um, working from the home page again on that sort of tailored experience, what I've done is I've, I have an Office 365 account set up, and hoping that this will process through my virtual machine here. I actually haven't had a chance to test it that my virtual machine sees the internet off of this link. Uh, and so, surprise. But, um, so imagine an Office 365 page here. Um, what, I, what I can do is I, I can actually associate the external uh, web link here um, by going through manage links. And I could create as an end user, I could create a link to the sites that I go to most commonly. Um, but I can also go. Um, I can also go off of a project. So we'll, we'll pick this one as a specific example because, again, very common in the engineering construction um, space. Um, a project might need to have a team site set up. So let's just go ahead and, and create a new project here, just quickly, and uh, we'll call this my new project number two. We'll associate this with a time and materials group. My favorite contract, number one. Use the handy little trick that I saw earlier. So I'm back to, backdating this project to start from 1-1-2015 uh, and clicking on OK. Now when I come into, uh, when I come into the project, I have this uh, option here. Um, for creating a collaboration workspace. Now, in this case, I've got it set up so that I'm creating a collaboration workspace automatically. And what this does is it actually makes a call to uh, some settings that I have uh, put together in organization admin that call a SharePoint team site collaboration uh, template, create it in the background in the SharePoint form, right? apply the template, and then provide some basic information on this. And so then from here now, what I do is, you know, this is a very common scenario. We've got to be able to manage a lot of uh, client emails, uh, secure documentation, that sort of thing. 
So what I do is I go through and I actually set up and you know CC my uh, uh, you know CC my SharePoint site on any outbound emails by default, and I create an email repository so all of the emails for a particular project are always associated with that project via collaboration space. Um, when I go through and I do things like uh, import a Microsoft Project template, I can couple that with the space and actually push in like high-level timelines and essentially use the power of SharePoint as a tool to be able to have a large number of people who may not be Dynamics AX users still have access to the type of information that's necessary for them to be able to do their job. So this helps out on a few fronts. It reduces the number of Dynamics AX end user licenses that are required. Obviously has a SharePoint licensing impact, um, but SharePoint licensing is lower cost. It's a more effective tool. It's easier to manage external access. And it's a better tool for doing things like document management, email management, and looking at high-level task lists. Uh, that SharePoint linkage happens. It's available. So the, the link that I was showing earlier off the home page where I wasn't able to get outside of the network, um, what we see a lot of people do is actually set up team sites using Office 365, associate that with the project here under the external URL, and then do all their document management uh, and WBS management um, via SharePoint. So I've got uh, just a couple of minutes here. I want to show one more element here uh, for being able to import uh, WBS. And let, me, uh, let me actually move into the project that I just created. All right. Now for anybody who needs to build up a WBS quickly, um, again, this is great for early implementation stages is a uh, very common process is to go through and create repositories for all of the project header information and then leverage the tools, often uh, Excel, maybe copied and pasted into MS Project and formatted so we've got WBS uh, indents and outdents and breakdowns. And then taking uh, that WBS and importing it um, from, uh, uh, importing it from project. So I think I've got a couple of templates in here. Let's just look at it quickly. So there we see a number of different project template types. I have two options when it comes down, just like we'd see in a lot of the other integration points with uh, Microsoft Office elements. I can push from the template. I can do this from Excel as well uh, in, in using uh, the, the template approach that we were discussing earlier, where I can actually have an embedded item and create a template. I can also import data from a template and, and other tools like Microsoft Word. Uh, much more common to come from Excel or MS Project, though. And you, you'll notice inside of the Office suite here that I have a new tab that's called Dynamics AX. And I could publish this uh, right, uh, to a, a project. And what the Office tool right now is doing is going out and looking for information like the legal entity. And um, then I can go through and, and actually look for the project that I have available. Uh, and we just created a new one called My New Project 2. And in this case, what I've done, uh, implementation scenario, um, or you know, a scenario where we've got a lot of people who are skilled users of MS Project in the field, we actually have them working inside the tool they're familiar with, and then when they're ready for publishing, they go through and they publish this into a project that we give them information about. Oh, and it's telling me they already have the WBS open, so we actually have some controls in place too. All right, so looks like I'm out of time, guys. Um, what I'm doing right now is I'm publishing this. If anyone wants to stick around, see how it happens or goes through, uh, happy to entertain that. Uh, any questions or anything else that anybody has, please feel free to come up and approach me. Um, my email address as well, if anybody needs to get me, it's very easy. It's McGraw, M-C-G-R-A-W, at Microsoft.com. So I want to say thank you for everybody for attending this morning. Uh, hopefully you got some useful content out of this and I would really encourage you to go through and see some of the other great tools that we have going on in the services industry track. All right. Thank you.